including the New York Times bestseller, Bullies, How the Left's Culture of Fear and Intimidation Silences America. He has also been a nationally syndicated columnist since he was 17 years old and a graduate of UCLA and Harvard Law School. So he's not accomplished too much uh, in his short life so far. Uh, Shapiro has led the fight against boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel on America's campuses, famously crashing UCLA's BDS hearing to single-handedly stop a vote against anti-Semitism. Glenn Beck calls Shapiro a warrior for conservatism against those who use fear and intimidation to stifle honest debate. The Washington Post, in the aftermath of Shapiro's devastating destruction of Piers Morgan on national television, conceded that Shapiro is a foe of extraordinary polemical agility. That's quite a phrase. Along with his many professional accolades, Ben Shapiro is a husband and a father to two young children, and we are quite honored to have him here today. So please join me in welcoming Ben Shapiro. It makes me feel so old when people say that they were writing essays about me in high school now. <laughs> so thank you all for coming out. YAF is an incredible organization. I'm honored to work with them at campuses all over the country. And what they do really can't be overstated. They, they do, I think, two really key things. The first is they provide all sorts of resources and all sorts of impetus for enthusiasm for all of the conservative students on campus and the conservatives who don't know they're conservatives on campus but soon find out. And that's why we've done this lecture series for the last year and a half with the sponsorship of people like Wendy uh, and, uh, and people like you. And that means that we've talked to literally thousands upon thousands of students over the past year directly in person. I mean, we, we haven't had a lecture that wasn't filled up with people out the back of the room for a year probably. Uh, ever since things started to go crazy on campus at, at University of Missouri. Uh, the, the, the speech that we just gave at, at UC Santa Barbara, it wasn't just there were 1,000 people who were there, it was watched simultaneously online by 750,000 people. So the, so the numbers on these things are pretty astonishing, and virtually everybody who's watching this, or at least a huge percentage of the people who are watching this are young people. It's a disproportionately young audience. So the first thing that, that I think YAF does beautifully and better than anybody else is they provide all of these resources. They, they make sure that, that young people have what they need in order to succeed on these campuses. But the second thing that happens is because these things create so much buzz, because the entire left is activated against it, a lot of people show up just out of curiosity. A lot of people on the left show up out of curiosity. People who don't know they're political show up out of curiosity. And I can tell you, because I receive dozens of emails a day from young leftist students or former leftist students who say, even if they're not right-wing yet, even if they're not conservative yet, they'll say things like, you know, you, you opened my mind to new ideas that I hadn't heard before just because YAF is on campus. I'm starting to consider ideas differently because you were here in a lot of cases I started listening to you because of a, a YAF lecture. I started doing my own reading. I started listening to your show and listening to other shows, and now I'm a conservative, so thanks for that. There's a lot of that going on all around, and a lot of that is as a result of the intolerance and the fascism, the ideological fascism of the left on campus. There is a reaction building to that. So what you see on TV is the riots at Berkeley, or you see the near riots at Cal State LA, but what's actually happening is a lot of people are really tired of that left, right, and center, and they're looking for an alternative. And the fact that YAF is so committed to free speech and putting people like me on campus, the fact that YAF is fearless about going into situations like we were at DePaul University, and we were, told, we were invited by the local YAF chapter at DePaul, and the administration said no. The administration wouldn't allow it to happen on campus, so we set up an event with Christina Hoff Summers, and then I was going to come in as a guest speaker to a Christina Hoff Summers lecture. And then they said I couldn't even come in as a member of the audience. And so I actually showed up on campus with my two security guards uh, and, and this nine-foot security guy stands right in front of me uh, and says, if you take one more step, we'll have you arrested. They brought out the sheriff of Cook County to arrest me if I st step one foot on campus. YAF backed us throughout the whole thing. YAF was there every step of the way. And then, of course, we immediately took the entire student body, basically, and we went to the small theater off campus and did the lecture anyway, and it was watched by hundreds of thousands of people online, completely defeating the purpose of what the left wanted to do. They wanted to shut it down, and instead what ended up happening is hundreds of thousands of people watched it specifically because the left tried to shut it down. And we've had this experience at campus after campus. And again, the reason that's important, I think, is not just because it gets all the conservative students jazzed up, feeling like they're not alone. I remember when I was in college, if you were conservative, you felt alone, right? If you were in, when I was in college, I graduated 2004, and when I was in college, 
If you were a college Republican on campus, if you were a conservative on campus, there was really not a ton of support if you didn't know about YAF, and we didn't at UCLA. And so what that meant is that there wasn't a lot going on. Now the, the base of support is enormous, uh, and the ability to bring in top-notch speakers, not just like me, but like Dinesh and, and Alan West and, and the whole slate, is really great. And I think something else is important, too, and that is that YAF really does stand not by particular political figures as much as by conservative principles. And this is something that I focus on a lot in my speeches, and this is where I think that we are able to reach out to people who are, who are in the center and on the left, which actually is an important thing. You know, I'm kind of seen as a firebrand publicly, but the fact is that when I do my talks, I try to remove emotion from the equation entirely and just speak in terms of conservative principles. So if people on the left hate Trump, which, I mean, there is a knee-jerk reaction now to Trump, for whether you love him or hate him, right? Okay, there, there's a knee-jerk reaction on the left to Donald Trump. There is no question, which is why they're all going nuts and wearing pussy hats and being idiots and having, you know, what, what was it? They, they just had a, and outside the Texas legislature, they just had a queer dance off or something because they hate Trump so much. Like, that's what they called it. Uh, and so, the, you know, they, they hate Trump. But what that means is that if you go on campus and you just talk about conservative principles, and the conservative principles are not about Trump per se, they're shocked. They don't know what to do because the picture in their head is of these demon ogres who drool from their fangs coming into their campuses and shouting about the KKK. And then you come in and you actually are just talking about like Milton Friedman and Frederick Hayek and they have no clue what to do with it. They have no clue whatsoever. So I go to these lectures and I mean, they'll, they'll, the protesters, when we went to University of Wisconsin, protesters got up and they started shouting about how I was a member of the KKK and a neo-Nazi. You see this thing on my head? This is good evidence. <laughs> that I am not one of those two things. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I think YAF does better than anybody, and I think that's what we have to work on as a movement, is that it's great that we won. It's great that we're going to continue to win on the right. But I think in order for us to continue to win long-term on the right, we're going to have to get people to buy into conservative principles and not just into the temporary fluctuations of a public. Because the fact is, eight years ago, we thought that we were never going to win again, and now we think we're never going to lose again. So the fact is that we will lose again and we will win again because history is not a is not uh, unlike what President Obama says. History does not only move in one direction. There's lots of vacillation. Right? Ronald Reagan is right when he says that freedom is one generation away from extinction, but the truth is it's also one generation away from restoration. And so what I think Yaf is focused on, what we've been focused on, is getting that young generation ready for the restoration because there will be battles to come. The battle is not over. It didn't end with Trump. It's not going to stop with Trump. It's not going to stop with the Republican Congress. Hell, we don't even know how this is going to go yet. Right? I mean, a lot of the stuff that's happening is good. We can hope that it lasts the next four years. It would be nice if Congress would actually do something aside from sitting on its butt. But it's... It <laughs> But the fact is that young people all over the country, I think, are ready to embrace – they're so tired of a, a media that lies to them and of a left that lies to them and of professors that lie to them. They're ready for something resembling truth and intellectual honesty, and that's what conservatism is here to provide. Truth is not a left-wing value. My friend Dennis Prager says this. Truth is not a left-wing value. If we can provide truth, there's no way for them to deny it, and that's what we come to do. So here's the situation on college campuses right now, aside from what YAF is doing. The situation on college campuses is pretty dire. It's more dire than I've seen uh, in the last 15 years since I left college. I've spoken at hundreds of colleges across the country. The last year and a half has been something completely different. It's been a complete change in tone and tendency. It's something that I hadn't seen before. You didn't get riots on campus before, except in very rare instances. Now you've got major mainstream figures like Ion Hersey Ali and Jason Riley of the Wall Street Journal being blocked, Condoleezza Rice being blocked from campuses because these people are quote unquote too extreme. What makes them too extreme? Somebody's feelings were hurt. All the left cares about right now is the idea that if their feelings are hurt, somebody must be banned. All, and this springs from this, this ideology of what they like to call intersectionality. Intersectionality is the idea that we're not going to judge you by the content of your character. We're going to judge you by the value of your identity. And so it's reverse Martin Luther King. And the idea is that they have this hierarchy of victimhood. And at the top are LGBT people, and then there are black people, and then there are Hispanic people, and then there are Native American people, and then there are females, and there are Asians. Down here are the Jews, and at the very bottom are the straight white males. Right? And, so if you, and so the way they can tell if something is good or not is, what, is if it's coming from one of these people. It has to be, first of all, if you're right-wing, it's ruled out immediately. But if it's not coming from a right-winger, then we judge the value of what you have to say by whether it offends any of these groups. And so if you could find what I like to call the unicorn of intersectionality, right? if you could find the LGBT, three-quarters black, one-quarter Native American, 
lesbian little person, that person, that person would be the greatest of all available intersectional unicorns, and that person could just judge for us what our politics and our values should be because this is the greatest person. We found them. We don't have to know what they think. They might be a Nazi, but it doesn't matter. All that matters is that this person has fulfilled all of the identity quotas, and therefore we have to listen to them. And on campus, this philosophy has really taken root. So if you step on campus and it's offensive to the black student group, then they will try to shut you down. If you step on campus and you're going to say something that offends the feminists, they will shut you down because if you're a white male and you're talking about abortion, for example, you can't talk about abortion. Women have a higher rank on the intersectionality scale than you do, and that means that you have to shut up. Fortunately, you can always identify as a woman and then you're transgender and you outrank a woman on the intersectionality <laughs> scale. So what's happening, so what's been created on campus is what I like to call victim privilege. This idea that if you're a victim, then you have a certain privilege. You get to shut people down, you get to shut them up, you get to make sure that they never speak. And this creates an entire generation of really bad people. Because if you are trained from the time that you are young, that the only thing important in life is whether you're a victim or not, and then you get extra credit for being a victim. If you subsidize victimhood, you're going to get more of it, just like anything else in life. Colleges subsidize victimhood. They tell you, you are a victim. You're a victim of the system. You're a victim of the evil white founders who created this evil white system for other evil white people. And therefore, if you are a victim, you have additional cachet in the moral discussion. And once that happens, you're training people to feel victimized, and you're training them to tear down the system. And that's what these colleges have been doing. They've been training people to feel victimized, and that's where you get the language of microaggressions that I'm sure you've been hearing and you have no idea what it means because it's not a real word. Okay, so when, when they say microaggressions, what they mean is somebody said something offensive that you don't like, right? But it's, it, they don't have to mean to be offensive. It could just be a thing that you find offensive, but you've been victimized, and therefore you have that extra moral cachet. So they say things, this is real. For example, if you say on a college campus today, where are you from? On many college campuses, the administrators will, will say this is a microaggression. You should have things like sensitivity training. You should be called on the carpet. Why? Because where are you from implies you're not from right here. Right? It means that you, you think that the person's a foreigner. Well, I mean, I asked my wife where she was from. I knew she was from America. I mean, like, I, I assumed she wasn't born on this spot. I mean, you ask people all the time where they're from without assuming that you're, you're making some sort of xenophobic reference to them crossing the border illegally or something. But, but the fact is that the microaggressions have become a big thing on college campuses. The big one, of course, that's now taken effect is uh, what I was very pleased with Grant Strobel uh, doing what he did over at University of Michigan, the, the chair of, of YAF. Uh, he, uh, he, he was asked about choosing his identity. So there's a thing on college campuses now to make sure that we don't microaggress you. We have to ask you whether you are a male identifying person or a female identifying person or one of the other 56 genders on Facebook. There are like a bunch of them. Um, and you get, to, you get to name your pronoun. You, get to, you actually get to pick your pronoun. So there are people at campuses I've gone to where they'll, they'll walk around, they're administrators, they wear name badges, and it'll say things like Linda, and then underneath it'll say he, right? And because they got to pick their pronoun. So what Grant did, which I think is great, is, is Grant applied to the University of Michigan uh, to be called His Majesty. So he... <laughs> So his actual pronoun at University of Michigan is his majesty. He must be addressed as his majesty under all circumstances because he self-identifies as an emperor. <laughs> and I think that's, honestly, that, the humor is where the hope lies because if you can't laugh at this, you have to cry. It's just so ridiculous. Because they, when they establish safe spaces, right, they, what they say is that once you've been microaggressed, you need a safe space. And the safe space is a place where you're protected and no one can insult you. And you can, you can be safe to be yourself. You can be free to have all your feelings validated, right? It's just like preschool. And so there's, there, there are colleges now that are setting up actual segregated safe spaces. Black students are saying, I don't feel safe around white people. I want a segregated safe space, which is exactly what the KKK says, right? KKK is real happy with black segregated safe spaces. It's their, they, they like it. The white Richard Spencer and the white nationalists are very pleased with blacks only safe spaces. The, the fact that the left ideology is eating itself right now is great fodder for us. It's great fodder for comedy. It's, it's dangerous because the victimhood that it confers makes people feel empowered. It makes people feel like they're more valuable. It makes people feel special. It makes you feel special to be a victim. Very few people in life want to take responsibility for their own actions. Conservatism at root is about you taking responsibility for your own life and taking responsibility for your own actions. Once you say, I'm in control of my life, whether I succeed or fail is up to me, you're no longer on the left. The left says that society is out to stop you from doing that, which is why we need to reconstruct society along Marxist lines. The right says, look, you're in a free country. Do what you want to do. No one cares. 
Once you say to people that it's their responsibility to do what they want, it's both empowering and disempowering. It's empowering in the sense that now they can do what they want. It's disempowering in the sense that if they fail, it's their fault. And that's very scary. It's very scary to a lot of people, a lot of people on college campuses who remember it doesn't start on college campuses. It starts in preschool and all the way through public school, all through high school, and then all the way to college. You've been told that you're a victim, and if you fail, it must be somebody else's fault, and this is how you get the Democratic Party. And the, the fact that you have so many people in the, in the college system who believe this is really dangerous, and they're churning out more people who believe this, which is why only 40 percent, I think it's the, the last statistic I saw was 40 percent of college students, this is from a November 5, 2015 pupil, 40 uh, percent of college students said that they would like the government to be able to prosecute people who say offensive things to different racial groups, right? which involves the actual revocation of the First Amendment. They feel that way because obviously society's out to get them. They can't be, they can't be free unless somebody else is stopped. S colleges specialize in churning out this type of person. And that's what we all have to fight. And the way to fight that is with humor. And the way to fight that is with truth. And the way to fight that is by shining a spotlight on the stupidity of all of this. Because all of the things they say about white privilege, America being built on white privilege, and white people are constantly victimizing people of other races. This is the freest country for the people who live in it in the history of mankind. The idea that, the white, that this country was constructed on behalf of white privilege is asinine on every level. I mean, the, the simplest way to debunk this is that the people with the highest average household income in the United States are Asian. Right? So the, the Constitution was not written by the Koreans. Right? It wasn't written in Korean for Koreans. So it's, it, but all of these words float around to confer this victimhood. It's our job to fight that victimhood. And that's what I think YAF is doing every day on campuses. And that's what I'm dedicated to doing. And once you tell people this, it's so empowering. You're going to see a lot of young people who want to get active specifically because you said to them they can get active. They feel enervated. It turns out that victimhood, while it confers on you this privilege and it makes you feel good about yourself, it also enervates you. It makes you feel like you can't make a difference in the world. It makes you feel like you can't make things better in the world because you've been told that the system is out to get you and victimize you. We can, we can give them a better message, and the message is it's up to you. No one cares enough to stop you. It's up to you. Be part of the freest society in the world. Be successful in that society, and then you'll have something to brag about. Then you will have privilege that is not conferred. It's earned. And earning is, is what conservatism is all about. So once we do that, I think that we can win. And I think we're starting to see the beginnings of that. Thanks so much. Happy to take questions. I'll repeat the questions for people who can't hear. Oh, I guess there's a mic going around. Please wait for the mic. <laughs> All right. How you doing, Ben? Hey, doing pretty well. How Thanks are you? so much for coming. My name is Hayden Martin, and I go to Fullerton City College. Um, my question is, uh, I'm doing a speech in my public speaking class about white privilege and why it's a myth. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I brought up this topic in class, everybody just lost their mind. Yeah. yeah. And they said, you can't talk about it because you're white. And it's, you know, how do you respond to that? In I mean, the first thing I would say is check your privilege. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, why don't I get to say it because I'm white? Are you a racist? Is the argument less valid because I'm white? Why well, argue with the argument as opposed to arguing with the color of my skin? It seems a little bit racially discriminatory that you're not allowed to speak based on the color of your skin. Either the argument is good or the argument is bad. How about this? How about if I get a black friend to come in and I hand them the text of my speech and she reads it? <laughs> then is it a better argument? Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, hi, Ben. My name's, oh, hi, Ben. My name's Kyle Chu. I'm at Saddleback. Thanks for coming out. And lately, in the last couple of months, I've noticed the rise of populism disguising itself as conservatism. They use the name conservative while uh, you know, taking to personalities as opposed to principles. And they call people conservative values. I think it's spineless idiots and Cucks. things like yeah. that. Exactly. You, you, yes. you probably heard them all. And I've even heard them say yes. in the last couple of days that <laughs> Reagan and Buckley conservatism is dead. But yeah, still I heard a member of the White House say that conservatism is sclerotic yeah, so yesterday. How would you address mm -hmm. these people, and what would you do about populism disguising itself as conservatism? Populism is not an ideology. Populism is a strategy. Okay, Bernie, Bernie Sanders is a populist. Donald Trump is a populist. That's a strategy. It's not an ideology. Populism just says, quote, unquote, the people should rule, and I'm going to appeal to the people directly as, as, as opposed to the elites. And anybody can do that routine. It's just a political strategy. So when people disguise a strategy as a, as a philosophy, I think that's wrong. You have to say, okay, what do you mean by populism? 
And then we can boil down whether it's something that's worthwhile or not. But when people just say populism and then they say, well, it's just it's the power back to the people. You have to ask which people, what power. Like, let's get a little bit specific here. Because if by populism you mean a trillion-dollar infrastructure plan, well, I remember when there was a populist leftist who was saying the same thing, and we didn't like it so much. Right? So, it, but if by populism you mean that you want to cut down regulations because you think that people are being beaten down in West Virginia by energy regulations, that's a different sort of populism. So you need to, you need to tell me what policies you're espousing Populism is not a philosophy. So when people say a nationalist populist philosophy, what they're really talking about is they're, they're trying to put an intellectual veneer on a basket of policies that don't really have a coherent through line except for we want to build big stuff, government is good when we say it's good, it's not so good when we don't say it's good, and, and all the rest. That doesn't mean that everybody who calls themselves a nationalist populist isn't a conservative. It doesn't mean that people who, who are nationalist populist in the White House aren't going to pursue some conservative policies. There's certainly crossover with conservatism in certain areas. But the idea that nationalist populism, and the reason I, I, I say this is because I get this a lot, that it means the Constitution is defunct. Right? The constitutional conservatism is old, it's over, it's been replaced by something else. Eternal principles don't die just because somebody won. Okay, they didn't die because of Obama. They're not going to die because of Trump. And, you know, I, and I think that, frankly, Donald Trump is being converted to some of the conservative principles by the people around him, or at least I hope he is. I think a lot of people in this room hope he is. Right? So the, so, and, and that's why a lot of people voted for him. So, you know, again, when people say that conservatism has to be replaced, the question is with what? And the question is why? And don't let slogans and, and name-calling dissuade you because it's silly. There's nothing there. Well said. Thanks. Hi, Ben. Uh, thanks for coming today and uh, everybody uh, for being here. Uh, my question is, one thing that I find a distinguishing characteristic between the European left and uh, the university left professors and that sort of establishment with respect to anti-Semitism is that the Democrat Party, by and large, has been supportive of Israel um, you know, uh, and not anti-Semitic. Where I see it going now is more towards normative leftist thinking. Yeah. Um, you've got Keith Ellison, who's about to get or very possibly uh, the head of the DNC, supported by two Jewish people, by Bernie Sanders and by Chuck Schumer, uh, ostensibly in deference to the this wave of leftist Bernie progressive. Sanders, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Bernie Sanders and Chuck Schumer right. as well. So where do you see it going in this country realistically? I know we need to fight against it. We need to have people like you and, 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 the, and the young... On uh, the Israel issue? I mean... Uh, the, not, no, not really Israel, but just actually real and leftist anti-Semitism, like they have in the Labor Party in yeah, uh, you know, Corbyn yeah. and in England and in France. I mean, leftism... The, like, the truth is that the Democratic Party, as you say, was sort of a world outlier in terms of the left. The left has not been supportive of Israel since the 1960s. When they realized that Israel was not a socialist little victim of Arab countries surrounding it, but was actually a repository of Western thought in a really backward part of the world, uh, the left flipped. And it didn't happen to be coincidental that they flipped about the same time that the Soviet Union flipped and started supporting Israel's enemies. Um, but you know, as far as, as far as where that's going with the international left, yeah, the international left despises Israel. I think the Democratic Party uh, is moving to the left extraordinarily quickly. Uh, and and it's it's very dangerous, obviously. The 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 old school. Th this is why I think that there there is a realignment taking place, and I don't think that the only realignment that's taking place is on the right. I think there's some realignment taking place on the left. I think a lot of old school people on the left who were supportive of Israel are looking at the new Democratic Party and they're going, "Wait a second, this is not what I signed up for." And that conflict is now playing out in the open. Um, but it's yeah, I mean it's it's. Obviously, a scary time if you're if you're an advocate of uh, if you don't like anti-Semitism, uh, then it's it's a scary time. I think on, on a lot of fronts. Unfortunately, I wish I could say more than that, but I think that's pretty much it. Hi, thanks hey, for coming out. I am pretty passionately anti-abortion. Mm -hmm. I know you also are. Yes. And invariably, it always comes up when I have discussions with people that I'm a conservative, because if I'm pro-life, obviously I must worship Trump, which I don't worship him, but I definitely wish him well. Um, but it comes up that I'm hypocritical, because I'm conservative, and therefore I don't support welfare, I don't support food stamps, I don't support these kinds of programs yeah. that have been proven, obviously, you know, kind of to be detrimental in the long run. And my response to that is typically non-response, <laughs> because yeah. I just get irritated. Um, I guess I'm looking for a Shapiro-esque response. Okay, so this is a, <laughs> <laughs> sure. So the so the response to the why don't you want to tell you know you care about babies before they're born but not after they're born right that's usually the way that this argument goes. Yeah, it's a really dumb argument. It's the same argument as basically saying to somebody, well, you know, there's a guy walking on the street 
should he be murdered or not? And you're like, no. Like, well, you're not taking him into your house, are you? Well, I don't have to take him in my house to make me not want to see him murdered. Right? They're two different issues. I don't have to adopt the guy. I just don't want to see him stabbed on the face in the middle of my sidewalk. Right? I mean, like, it's, I'm, I, opposing murder does not mean that it is now your job to personally support the person who is not murdered. That's a ridiculous standard. I mean, it's a ridiculous standard by any stretch. It's true for all criminal law. You should ask them, do you, oppo- you should say this, do you oppose murder? Like an actual murder, I mean like of an adult. Do you oppose you getting stabbed today, right? Or your friend getting stabbed today? Presumably they, they will say yes. If not, then you should run. But, it's, <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you say, you know, this person, you see this person walking by, do you, do you think it would be good if they got stabbed or okay or acceptable? Would you look the other way if they got stabbed? Presumably they'd say no. You say, well, why don't you adopt? But you're not willing to adopt that person. I mean, you don't care what happens to that person as soon as they get out of your eye line. Right? As soon as they're gone from your site, you forget about them entirely. What, what about their problems? What about the fact that they, they can't afford contraception? How about that? You know, are you going to take care of their contraception now? It, 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 what they do, the left likes to do this. They take two questions and they conflate them. And then they pretend that, that they have moral stature because of that. Right? They do this on abortion a lot. Right? They do it, they, what they, they, their favorite is, is not – that one's a big favorite. The other one that's a big favorite is you know, rape and incest. What do you do about cases of abortion and rape and incest? And as I've said before, how about this? Before we, uh, you can answer the question. I'll give my, my answer to the question. But before we do that, how about we stipulate that all of the abortions that are not done for reasons of rape and incest are bad? If you're willing to stipulate that, then I'll take on your second question. Or is it just that you want to talk about rape and incest because you don't want because you want to lump that together with all the other abortions, which is really what they want to do, right? They want to say rape and incest. We'll take the hard case and then we'll use that and pretend that that's like the normal case. Okay, 98% of all abortions are not rape and incest. So how about this? How about you assume? I'm willing to, how about this? I would even make the trade, just for the sake of saving babies, if all we could do, if all we could do was save 98% of the babies who are not conceived through rape and incest, I'd make, I'd make a trade with you. It'd be a, the worst trade ever, but I'd make the trade with you that rape and incest, we could still leave up for discussion, but the other 98% of babies, no. Are you okay with that? And of course they'll say no. Say right, because you, because you don't want to have this argument. You're just trying to do a gotcha question. As far as the answer on rape and incest, by the way, the proper answer on rape and incest, if you're a pro-life person on these issues, is rape is horrible. Rapists should be castrated or killed. Incest is evil. That doesn't mean you get to kill babies. They're two separate issues. YAF is doing a uh, great job of going on the campuses and giving an alternative to the students on the campus to new ideas differently and well presented. My question, though, is that for a long, long time, the Democrats or, or left-wingers, perhaps better said, have been aiming at edu- taking over education. And they've, st- they've taken over. It's not just the university campuses. It's the high sure. school campuses. It's the grammar schools. What kind of a long-range plan would you suggest or, or throw out some ideas on how we could go b- about taking back the educational system? So I think that obviously the first step is to maintain local control of the education system. And the biggest problem is that as you federalize it, it tends to get more lefty. Uh, the second step you could do would be to get rid of public sector, public sector teachers' unions because all of them tend to be left. And the reason they tend to be left is because then they can unionize against the government, which means against the taxpayer. So they're in favor of bigger government just so that they can get paid more. It's what the, the public sector unions do. So you get rid of public sector teachers unions as they did in Wisconsin. That'd be a good step. And honestly, my biggest answer is give people vouchers and make it more affordable for people to get out of the public school system entirely because a lot of the public school system, particularly in California, sucks. I mean, I, I, was, I, went, to, I went to LAUSD. LAUSD is the worst public school district in the country. It's, it's enormous, and it's bloated, and it should be four or five separate school districts. But because it's one city, they've made it one giant school district, and it's, and it's administered by a bunch of leftists administrators. Uh, so you know, I think that that's, that's the easiest solution. But that requires particularly religious people to get very active and say, I'm not gonna, it may be cheaper for me to send my kids to public school, but I'm not going to because of the values involved. And I think that as, as you do that, as you get more competition in the, in the marketplace for, for lower parochial schools, uh, then the, the price drops and you get more people in those schools, which would be a tremendous thing. It would be a tremendous thing. I'm, I'm not a fan of our public education system. And I think that it's, it's great that you have it as long as it's locally controlled and not federally controlled or state, even state controlled. It should be really, really locally controlled. Um, but if you can't have that, then you should have a private school that, that people can go to and and I think it's a really worthwhile endeavor, if you have a lot of rich people in this room, it's a worthwhile endeavor to try and sponsor scholarships, particularly for, for example, inner city students to stop going to local public schools, which really are terrible and indoctrinate people in leftism, and to instead be able to go to better private schools. 
Um, hi. Um, um, but um, sorry. Um, I get a little nervous, but um, because um, I'm a little nervous because um, y uh, you really impressed me um, on, on Tuesday. Um, it was the first time I heard I heard you speak. So um, that was a great speech. Oh, no worries, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I uh, I currently uh, plan on um, running for the, uh, the, uh, the Senate of, of my of uh, UCSB's um, uh, Associate Students to the Government. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and one of my goals is if I'm if I'm elected to um, is to start to uh, uh, to to work on uh, reversing the. Um, Leftist trends that have been going on on campus and, and, and making um, uh, UCSB a more open campus where ideas can be expressed more freely mm -hmm. and where it's not dominated by just um, leftist doctrine. Okay. Um, do you have any like a uh, specific like, advice or strategies on like um, how to do that um, um, w w without being um, too like uh, ideological, as in like uh, being yeah, uh, without being too specifically partisan. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, I think that the, the best way to do that is to propose general rules that also happen to apply to conservatives. So, there should be a general rule at all these campuses that the administration should not be able to tell police officers not to remove protesters. Like this has been a big thing. It didn't happen at UCSB, thank God, but we've had a bunch of situations where administrators have told police officers not to remove protesters on campus, or they'll shut down the event. That actually happened at University of Wisconsin. So we had all these idiots actually line up in front of the room to uh, to protest for like 15 minutes. And th when we asked the cops, why don't you just take these people away to the loony bin? Instead, they suggested they they said if we shut them down, we have to shut down the entire event. So I think that a good measure would be to say. Just as a general rule, no one shuts down events. If you try to shut down an event, you're immediately booted. Uh, when it comes to student funding, the truth is that at a state school like UCSB, it's, it's a violation of the First Amendment for viewpoint discrimination to be the rationale for shutting down any event. And we've tried to launch lawsuits along these bases on, on various campuses, including CSULA. Um, you know, whether or not the judge was uh, into it is another question. But, uh, but I think that there are, you know, that's a good place to start. As far as fighting back against some of the more leftist policies that are open, so for example, you know, a lot of these campuses try to vote for divestment from Israel, as an example, for no reason. They just, it's like there are a bunch of students here and they divest from Israel like anyone cares. Uh, the, the, what you should, I think the best counter to that is you should lead a divestment movement against Iran, right? And see, and, and say, like, why is it that you won't back a divestment movement against Iran, but you'll back a divestment movement against Israel? Oh, right, it's because you hate Jews. Which is the actual reason, right? <laughs> so I think that you, you, for me to give you better advice, I'd have to have like the specific stuff that you were trying to stop. And I'm happy to, to give you advice on that sort of stuff. You can just contact Yaf and they'll give you my email address and I'm happy to respond to that more specifically. Hi, Mr. Shapiro. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. My name is Tiffany Haas and I'm from the University of Southern California. As you mentioned, <laughs> as you <laughs> mentioned in your speech, uh, we've seen the rise of safe spaces on our campuses. In some cases, universities will bring in psychologists to these meetings and they'll notate how students are feeling anxious, scared, or panicked after seeing a conservative speaker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I specialize in that, yeah. <laughs> I actually get kickbacks from the psychiatrists. It's, it's, it's a very lucrative business. <laughs> Considering your legal background, do you think that this so-called evidence can substantiate the silencing of conservative voice? No, and I don't think that most of these campuses actually, the, the truth is that when we speak on most of these campuses, the administrators are generally pretty good about trying to facilitate. They kind of stop us in, in small ways, but as a general rule, it's very rare that a campus will be like DePaul and just shut it down because the kids, you know, because the snowflakes melted. Um, but when, it, you know, as far as the idea that kids' feelings are hurt, and welcome to the real world. If you're feeling, this is my, my catchphrase, right? I'm like a TV character. I have my own catchphrase. My catchphrase is, facts don't care about your feelings. And, if, and unlike some people who speak on campus, my, my goal in speaking on campus is not specifically to offend people. I actually, the easiest thing in the world is to offend easily offended people. I mean, for, for, it, it's very, very simple. I mean, going on campus, it's always the stuff that goes viral. It's like, ooh, snowflake triggered. Okay, honest, honest to goodness, if you drop a pencil near these people, they, they flinch. It's, it, it's, it's the easiest thing in the world. So whenever you see somebody, oh, wow, he's a star because he made some leftist cringe. Okay, if I say he to a man, a leftist cringes. So it's not, it's not difficult. Um, it, but what's, what is troubling is the, is the tendency to, I, as you can tell from you know, my speeches, 
when I go on campus, I actually reel off stats and figures. And when people ask me questions, I cite specific legal cases. And I, I try to be as specific as possible about the factual evidence that I provide. If they're offended by that, that's their own damn problem. And if they want to be offended, and that's their choice, because you can choose to be offended or not. If you, if you want to be offended by what is clearly non-offensive language, then good luck to you in the real world where no one cares. I mean, try that on your employer. They come in and give you an assignment in the morning. You go, oh, my God. Oh, my God. You're going to be out on your ass the next day. And you should be. You should be fired immediately for that kind of crap. So I would hope that our, our schools would start you know, actually providing the, the, necess the necessities for holding a job in an actual society as opposed to being diversity studies coordinator at USC. <laughs> Well, hello, Mr. Shapiro. Thank you for coming. And I really hope you come to UCSB more and Santa Barbara in general. We really appreciate <laughs> you here. So I kind of have a I love, I love Santa Barbara, although I will say I was walking along the train tracks here, and there was some crazy guy talking to himself, and I thought, what is Harry Reid doing here? <laughs> well, Joe Biden makes visits occasionally, too. So <laughs> Anyway, um, I, one, one question I have is, something that I'd like a Shapiro-esque answer to. If I'm I like one that I'm getting a brand on this yeah. now. That's great. <laughs> You're kind of a celebrity. So if <laughs> I want to start a conversation on the Affordable Health Care Act, and I start talking about why it's crippling certain people, how do I respond when the first thing they say is, well, you know what? I would be dead without Obamacare. I would be dead. My child would be dead. And if you want them to die, something along those lines. Yeah, the, so the other question I have mm -hmm. is, I think there's something like a third of millennials, less than a third of millennials are conservative, and even less than that, um, millennials are evangelical. Something like 96% don't even have a, or that claim they're evangelical, don't even have a biblical worldview. So as someone that was brought up with the traditions of Israel, I'm sure you have insight as to, is how much stronger is the uh, religious persecution on leftist campuses? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not easy to be a religious person on campus. I'll answer the second question first. It's, it's, easier to be, it's not easy to be a, a religious person on campuses because you're perceived as stupid. I mean, the nice thing is if you do, you know, once you go to Harvard Law School, they can't say that anymore. But, it's, but, uh, but, they, but you get that a lot, right? It's the idea that you're a dummy for, for believing in religion. And the truth is, all of Western civilization is based on a Judeo-Christian value system. It hasn't sprung up anywhere else. I mean, there are tons of cultures all over the globe, and none of them have the kind of civilization America does. And America, by the way, is still significantly more religious than Europe, which is not coincidentally one of the reasons why we are significantly more powerful than Europe. So you know, when, when they say that, that you know, you're a fool for believing in God, the truth is that belief in God is belief. Right? It, you have to take a leap of faith. It can't be proved. It can't be something, it's not something that you can, you can make a scientific hypothesis and then, and then fulfill that hypothesis. But atheism can't be proved either. And there's no way to prove these sorts of intangibles. And what that means is that you can either choose to at least acknowledge. What I would say to people is, look, whether you believe in God personally is your own business. It is. It, uh, I, don't, I don't really care particularly. As a religious person, I care about your soul. But as a political person, it's your own business. I don't care. Um, it, but... As a society, when we fail to acknowledge the value of Judeo-Christian religion steeped in the idea that every human being has equal worth under God, you end up very quickly devolving into a socialism that ends up demeaning human beings individually. Because there's never been a place on earth that wasn't like that. The fact is that the collective takes over. People worship. People are made to worship. And we will either worship God or we will worship the state. Or we'll worship ourselves. Right? Those, those tend to be the three choices. You're either a libertine or you're a communist or you're a conservative. Those are, those are sort of the three choices. Uh, so you know, I think that when it comes to defending religion, it's easier to defend the system of religion than particular religious belief because we all have different religions. We all have different religious beliefs. Even, if you're, even among Orthodox Jews, there's a lot of diversity. Of, each individual has their own relationship with God, and you can't argue anybody else into your relationship with God. What you can say is here is something that is unquestioned and undoubted. Judeo-Christian religion has created the foundation for the greatest civilization in the history of mankind. And ripping away the foundations of that civilization on behalf of a philosophy that really has never built anything without those roots in Judeo-Christian – atheism, modern atheism has its root in Judeo-Christian religion. It does. It doesn't exist in the Islamic world, right? Modern atheism, the freedom to be an atheist, only exists in the West. It only exists in the, in the Judeo-Christian world. The, the freedoms that the left bases its whole worldview on are within a milieu that was created by a religion it despises. You can't just take a battering ram to the foundations of civilization and then hope the superstructure stands. So that's my answer as far as God. Uh, as far as the, the first question about the Affordable Care Act and when people cite tragedy, 
I mean, first of all, I think that the, the first answer you should give because it takes them back is, first of all, what's going on with you? You know, please tell me. No, no, like, please, please tell me, like, what's your, what's your health problem? And tell me the, the health problems that you're experiencing. And is there any way that I can personally help? The, it, right? I mean, because here, what they're saying is you're unsympathetic. That's really, their, their argument is not an argument. Their argument's an emotional appeal. They're not arguing that, that the policy is better. They're arguing, the, they're arguing the policy is better for me. Okay, I can't argue that the policy is better for you because it might be better for you. Right? If I confiscated all wealth in the United States and gave it to that person, presumably that policy would be better for them. It wouldn't be great for everybody else. But, and this is why there's a, a book that's recently come out about empathy in politics. and says that empathy in politics is actually extraordinarily harmful because when you put yourself in the other person's shoes, you only care about the other person. You forget about the millions of other people that it affects. And so you saw this at the town halls. I talked about this, I think, two days ago on my podcast. In the, if you looked at these town hall events, people were doing this. They would go out to these town halls. My husband is dying, and if you take away my Medicare, he's going to die, right? And, and you see Tom Cotton on stage, and what's he supposed to do? I right? say, good, your husband should, like, he's, he's not going to say your husband should die, right? And so it turns into this kind of mushy thing. The best answer to that is, how can I help you personally? Can I, can I bring your case to my church? Can I bring your case to my synagogue? Can we put a GoFundMe online? How can we get, how can we get money to help you, right? How can we help you? And now let's talk about the policies that help the vast majority of people. Let's talk about the policies that don't confiscate wealth from people or restrict their health options. Let's talk about the policies that are based on individual freedom and not based on just what you need. I'm happy to help you out as an individual, but you can't make policy based on that. Ben? Ben? Um, at UCSB, you skewered income inequality but you said it so fast, I didn't get it all. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so would you repeat it, please? Uh, uh, yeah, I, not to be insulting to anybody who's above the age of 60, but one of the reasons my, a large part of my audience is under the age of 40 is because I speak at two, two R, uh, you know, like 76 RPM. I'm, <laughs> it's, so uh, you know, it, what I said about income inequality is a few things. Number one, the idea that the people who are very, very rich somehow stole from the people who are very, very poor, and that's why they're very, very rich is stupid. Poor people are poor and don't have lots of money to steal. Okay, so the idea that, if you, that Bill Gates got rich by ripping off a bunch of homeless people. Homeless people were not buying Microsoft, nor was he going to them, forcing Microsoft on them for them to stick into their boxes. Right? Like that's, not how, that's not how he got rich. The way you get rich in any free-functioning economy is by participating in an enormous number of voluntary transactions that benefit both sides. You should care about the question of poverty, you shouldn't care about the question of income inequality. You should care about how do we make poor people rich, not how do we make rich people poorer so that everybody's at the same level. Because that's just you being jealous. That's just you not liking the guy's house next door because it's bigger than your house. And look at that, he has a big house, I have a smaller house, maybe I'll just go rob his place. Right? That's, not, that's not moral and it's not decent. And it's also not true. The fact is that while the left decries income inequality, the evils of capitalism, since 1994, the, the world extreme poverty rate has been sliced in half by increased capitalism and, and by free markets. Right? I mean, the free markets that are now being bashed left and right, those free markets are the greatest innovation in the history of humanity when it comes to the economy. It's why you have nice stuff. It's why you're not sitting in your backyard right now crafting your own handmade tie from a, from a sheep that you had to shear yourself. I mean, there's a, I thought there's a, there's a great thing. I mean, just there's a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a caveat on trade. I thought my favorite story of the last few months, there was some guy who decided that he wanted to make himself a BLT and see how much it cost to make the whole thing himself, right? Like from scratch. So he actually went and he bought a cow and then he, and, and he, and he like killed the cow and, and, he, and he went out and he got a pig and like he, like he went out and he did, he, he got, he milked and he made the cheese. He went out and he, he grew some wheat and then he milled it, right? This whole thing. It cost him $1,600 to make a BLT and it took him six months. Right? You can go down to your local restaurant and get a BLT for five bucks because of global trade and because freedom of, of, of income. And the fact is that when people talk about income inequality, what they're really saying is they don't understand how money works. They think that if, if there's two people in a room, one person with five bucks, one person with one, the person with five stole from the person with one. It doesn't ask the question, how did the person get poor? The reality is if you don't want to be permanently poor in America, it's very, very easy. The Brookings Institute, which is a left-leaning institute, they say you only have to do three things. Graduate high school, don't have babies out of wedlock, get a job. That's it. Those are the three things. 75% of the people who do those three things will end up in the middle class. Not just not poor, in the middle class. Only 2% of people who do those three things end up permanently poor in the United States. So the idea that, there's, that it's the rich people 
keeping poor people down, and they're doing it for their own pleasure, their own sick pleasure. Bill Gates, has, for sport, he shoots poor people from the balcony of his mansion. <laughs> it's just, it, it's asinine in every conceivable way. Uh, and, and it's so funny. I, I did a debate on National Geographic that never aired. And it never aired because it was brutal. Uh, and <laughs> it was me against three, which made it almost fair for them. And it was, it was like Van Jones, and uh, I think Van Jones is on the other side, uh, and some professor from NYU. And, uh, and they, they, it was exactly on this topic. And I said to them, are you proposing that we actually just kill the rich people and redistribute their money? And they said no. And I said to them, why are you, why are you talking about the rich people? What did they do? And they didn't have an answer because they don't know what the rich people did. They just know they want their cash. <laughs> the, the idea that income inequality is correlated in any way with overall poverty is really silly. There are countries with really high income inequality and very low overall poverty. That's like the United States. There are countries with zero income inequality, Sudan, and nobody has anything. <laughs> right? So the idea that the differential is the, is the statistic that matters, it doesn't. The fact is in the United States, nine out of 10 Americans are living above the global middle income standard. Right? Everybody in the United States is rich by global standards. And that, that, you know, you want to get rid of the income inequality by destroying that, good luck to you. We have one final question back here. Hello, Mr. Shapiro. My name is Andrea, and I am a Cal State LA student. Yeah, good luck to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm actually originally a Northern Californian. And so um, I'm from an area that's actually a bit more conservative than out here. And mm -hmm. so um, making the transition to living in Los Angeles, a very liberal city, that has a perception of conservatives as being rather um, racist and... Um, you look like a racist to me. Do I? <laughs> I know, I'm the only one here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so I guess my, my question is, where does this perception come from in a lot of like urban communities or more diverse communities that people who hold conservative values are um, racist. I mean, I think that the perception comes from a consistent drumbeat since the 1960s that anybody who opposes bigger government is racist. Here's a government program and we're designing it for inner city people, people of, of minority ethnicity specifically. I mean, this is sort of how LBJ used to talk, actually. Uh, and, what we're, and, and anybody who opposes that obviously opposes the aspirations of minority people. Or we're in favor of affirmative action that helps black people. Look at these crazy conservatives. They're not in favor of affirmative action. The only reason not to be in favor of affirmative action is because you're a racist. So it's very easy to call people against a group by suggesting that they oppose a policy that benefits a particular group. And that, that's, I think, what the left has done. They've said, here's a particular policy. It benefits this specific group. And now, if you oppose that policy, it's because you hate that group. Well, what if I just oppose, in general, group-specific policies, right? which is what conservatism is? Conservatism says, you don't get special treatment if you're white. You don't get special treatment if you're black. You don't get special treatment if you're anything because you're an individual human being and your race shouldn't matter. And the left says, that's racist. And you say, well, boy, wait, why is individualism racist? And the answer is because they don't see people in terms of individuals. So there's this great disconnect. You say individual, and somebody on the left looks at you, and the first thing they think is black person. They don't think a person with a mind. They don't think a person with their own political viewpoint. They look at me, and the first thing they say is Jew, right, really, because this, which is why, I mean, when I, I did a book called Primetime Propaganda about the TV industry, and I was able to get all of these leftists on record about how they keep right-wingers out. Why did I lie? I didn't lie to them. I told them my name was Ben Shapiro. I went to Harvard Law School. And they immediately assume, Jew in LA, got to be left, right? Because they, they judge me on the basis of group identity. The left breaks people down into group identities. And so it, it, it is anathema to them that you could be an individual with your own perspective on the universe and you ought to be treated as an individual. And it's very easy to get people sucked into that because the truth is that all human beings are to a certain extent tribal. Everybody is tribal. The less tribal we are, the better we are as human beings. I think that that's sort of the goal of, of religion generally. I mean, unfortunately, religious tribalism happens too, but I think that the goal of, of Judeo-Christian religion has been the universality of values, the goal of Western civilization, certainly the goal of America. The goal of America is that we are a nation based on a creed. There's been a lot of talk lately about nationalism. What does nationalism mean? Nationalism and patriotism, to me, mean what makes America great is the creed upon which we're based, not the color of the skin of the people here or the place they were born. That, that creed is what makes us a better country. It's what makes us worthy of God's favor. The left opposes that creed. The left doesn't believe that we're all individuals and that we all ought to be treated as individuals. And if you treat people as individuals, it, it, it's a blank spot for them. It's why if you say to, to people you're a conservative, they will actually say things like, well, then you're not legitimately black. Right? They will. They do it to Clarence Thomas. They say, well, you're, not, you're a bad black person. Really? Did the, did the skin color come with the Democratic Party card? Like, but but that's, the, that's the way they think because group identity is what trumps all else. And if that's the case, then we're finished as a country. Because the only group identity that ought to matter is your membership in the group of people who are decent and good, who work hard for their families and make the country a better place. Thanks so much.
All right, thank you so much for that wonderful talk, Ben. Um, very inspiring and encouraging for all of us in the audience. Before we all make our exit today, I have a few announcements about some upcoming events that we'd like to share with you. Um, first of all, our uh, first major student event at the Reagan Ranch Center will be our high school conference at the Reagan Ranch. This is one of five high school programs we'll be hosting here this year. Uh, it's already sold out, so sorry about that. Uh, we have a wait list of about 30 at this point, but we, there will be a round table associated with that. You should be receiving information about that very soon, and we hope that you'll join us uh, for that program. And then uh, in March, we will actually have a second round table as well. On March 31st, there will be a breakfast with Dr. Art Laffer, so please mark that on your calendar. And then uh, Rawhide Circle Retreat is coming up April 19th through 21st. It will be held in Charleston, South Carolina. If you are a Rawhide Circle supporter and you have not received information on this, please let one of... Uh, us know. Um, we hope you'll join us if you're able. And then lastly, for students, we will be doing a group photo with Ben uh, before everyone departs, so please stick around. And uh, that's it. Thank you all, and have a great day. We hope to see you later in March.